for my everlasting God, we come before you this morning. Give your honor to you and your presence to be alive this morning, Jehovah God. We pray that even as we begin this competition, oh God, that you may be with us, oh God. May you order our steps to the very end, oh God. Thank you for our guests, O King of all glory, and thank you for every participant and every person who is here, oh God. Our eternal blessing upon the Lord, God. Who will ask you to be with us, oh God. Amen. Let's thank you guys for the national anthem. Last, 
I want to uh, appreciate uh, our uh, VC, Professor Paul uh, Wainaina, uh, who could not make it, and therefore I give his apologies this morning. But he has sent his able uh, assistant or vice, uh, the DVC administration, uh, Professor Patuma Chege. I know most of you, probably uh, my students do not know Professor Patuma Chege. Maybe you can just stand and wave. This is our new uh, DVC administration, Professor Patuma Chege. Um, I'm told to make just brief remarks, but um, I hope I don't take very long. Uh, not for, to forget also, one of the participants who uh, we met somewhere, Dr. Maricela Oma, please just, pay, just greet the people. Yeah. That is Maricela from the Attorney General's office. Um, now, just a very small comment on uh, the All Kenya Mood Competition. This is the sixth condition of this uh, competition, which was started just at the time I was starting my my teaching um, um, six years ago. And it's very befitting that uh, today is the sixth edition of the same open and mood competition, and it also is also the anniversary of my, my leaving the leadership. So it's really a very, very uh, auspicious occasion for me and a great honor that I will be the dean making the, the, these remarks this morning uh, because there is an incoming dean uh, from uh, next week. So I thank God that I've been here to oversee the all Kenyan Wood competition in the East six editions, this being the sixth. And I just want to say that uh, the Royal Kenyan Wood Competition has been an annual event of my students in, in this school and it has been on various, the competition has on been various topics of interest um, over the years and as you can see the, the theme of today's Royal Kenyan Wood Competition is that um, you know striking the balance between respect for human rights and maintaining national security so what i can just say is that uh, we are very honored because two of the heroes of human rights and also matters of security are here the honorable attorney general just to look at tomorrow you have read the judgments, you know what he is doing in the courts, and therefore it's a great honor to have them with that kind of thing. Lastly, I just want now to welcome all our visitors from all the other schools, uh, and I would like to request if there's another dean from another school has come, just to stand up and just say hi. Then dean from our representative from the deeds from the other law schools. Any representative from the deeds? <laughs> yes. From? Yes, KC. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you for that meeting. Uh, next up, we shall have uh, a representative from the Independent Medical Unit, Mr. Peter Kiyama Hakad, to give, but we will be having Ms. Anne Lama who will be presenting Mr. Peter Kiyama. Around the world, please. Uh, the guest of honor, Justice Luca Kumalu, De Deputy Vice Chancellor, the Dean uh, Kenyatta uh, University Parkland School of Law, members of staff, the participants, and all uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, present today. Good morning. Uh, allow me to read uh, Peter Kiyama's uh, speech that he has had to give as uh, Timothy has already indicated to you. Uh, I'll read briefly the speech uh, to touch on today's theme, striking the balance between respect 
to human rights and maintaining national security, which is a theme that falls squarely under our mandate as Indo. I am honored and delighted to uh, congregate with you this morning to add my voice and that of Imru's board and staff to a matter, a struggle that touches on the life of every Kenyan, the struggle against impunity, the struggle against the culture of formal violence, the struggle against hopelessness among our youth, especially those who live in poverty and joblessness, a struggle against the culture of death. I thank those who choose uh, the theme it is not only relevant, but timely. Uh, he speaks to dualism. First, there has been the dual narrative of human rights and security being in opposition. For us to transform our governance process and systems, we need to discuss ourselves of this dualism. Human rights define human security. Individualism, international and national development requires protection of human rights. Therefore, you cannot have security without protection of your human rights. The problem is that we have fallen for state-centered definition of security, which is about protection of regimes in power and elite alliances. The situation is dire. Uh, just to point out, for instance, the recent Meru uh, student who was uh, brutally murdered by an allegation by a police officer. There's also the Kweke Mwandaza case. And recently, we also uh, seen in court the Nibipendo case. At Imbu, in 2017, we have recorded uh, 152 cases of extrajudicial killing. This is just to speak how the situation is there. The statistics from 2013 to 2017 shows a total number of uh, 764 recorded extrajudicial uh, cases of uh, killings. Medical uh, legal link in criminal justice and civil litigation has gaps. And we as in call upon uh, everyone to embrace the link between medical and legal in order to uh, assist the survivors of uh, extrajudicial killing at life and also as torture. Uh, thank you for that. And we look forward to having an interactive session and uh, may the best student win. I wish all of you luck. Distinguished Attorney General, Distinguished Justice Mali, uh, Dean of Kenyatta Law School, other distinguished guests and participants, uh, good, morning. good morning. It is good to be with you this morning. Um, I think this issue of the balance of the coercive powers of the state and the individual rights and freedoms of people is one of the great questions of our time. I think, as you see, this debate is happening everywhere in the world, from the United Kingdom, the United States, to Russia and China, to here in Kenya today, throughout Africa. This truly is something we're all looking to and asking, where, where is the line? How much force is needed? Right? How much force is too much? Uh, at International Justice Mission, we deal with this question every day. Our goal is to protect people from uh, powers of violence, and specifically, police abuse of power. So we see this all the time, and it actually became quite personal for us as an organization. When our colleague and friend, Willie Kamani, was killed uh, by police officers. So for us, um, this is not just theoretical, this is a, an important thing to, to drill down into and to look into. Uh, his case is ongoing, and one of our great hopes at IJM is that we will see that uh, when police overstep their bounds, uh, they are held to account by the state. At the same time, I would say we understand the difficult work that police officers have to do. They have been given the power to arrest and detain for reasons. You need law and order in your society, and you need police officers who will carry that out. And so it's a difficult, challenging job. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think this is why this topic is so interesting. I would also say that I think my generation around the world has, uh, has failed to address this issue. We're seeing it everywhere. It's, it's, as I said before, it's an issue all over this globe. 
And so what I love about today is to look out and to see young people, law students, who are going to debate, who are going to discuss, who are going to research this topic. And my hope is you shed light on what we can do around the world to address this issue of uh, individual rights for people, but also this, this state security system, the state power. So, like others, I wish you the best of luck. I'm very interested to hear what you talk about. And uh, yeah, we'll see the best woman or man who succeeds at the end of this time. Thank you. especially uh, in matters of extrajudicial killings. Um, in so doing, we, we have held a series of uh, community dialogues in different counties in the past uh, couple of years to try and identify victims of police brutalities whom we have uh, assisted to access justice in conjunction with uh, our various partners in the civil society. KHRC has also been involved in policy and uh, legislative uh, engagements and reforms together with the National Assembly. And we have engaged members of parliament to try and address gaps that are gaps in our law that uh, gives, gives, uh, give police uh, officers um, leeway to commit extrajudicial killings. Uh, the National Coroner's Bill and the Pre Prevention of Torture Act have greatly benefited from the input of KHRC. At the regional level, KHRC has also used its observer status to advocate for better policing services that include uh, ensuring police officers implicated in extrajudicial killings are uh, held accountable by responsible agency, agencies. Um, we have also used the regional platform to give to offer various recommendations towards uh, enhancing police reforms and accountability. So this moot court couldn't have come at a much better time. Uh, it's uh, come at a time when uh, critical issues of um, trying to strike the balance between national security and human rights um, are a discussion, especially following the, the uh, elections and uh, the post-election violence, which so many people uh, brutally uh, injured and even murdered by the police. So it is my belief that uh, the deliberations here will go a long way in addressing uh, critical issues of uh, judicial killings that form part of the strategic objectives of Kenya Human Rights Commission. Um, again, Kenya Human Rights Commission was very pleased to partner with the organizers of uh, this multiple. And uh, all the best to the participants. Thank you. Justice, the Honorable General, um, our Chief Guest, Justice Luka Kimaro, the Dean, Parkland's Chapter, and all protocols of ground, in addition to our great participants. Good morning. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. I just have a message from our Executive Director, Mr. Samuel Kimaro, who happens to be out of the country. Uh, as transparency, we we are the champions of fighting corruption. We have always been the the at uh, the forefront in, in the fight against corruption. So mine, I was just from the entire message from the family of Transparency International Kenya, 
my pleasure. Uh, we we are pleasure and we are so happy to have been part of partnering with uh, with uh, this great team in terms of organizing for this great discussion here. And we are looking forward to many more. In as much, uh, despite that, in as much as we wish the best lady and gentleman, the best of the two, uh, the best of luck, and uh, as we congratulate them in advance, ours is also to, in addition to that, to uh, add the youngsters that let's not let's 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 just keep the conversation going. Let's not stop it here. We have a lot to discuss. These are the kind of thematics that we are interested in. As transparency, we are looking forward to many more in terms of uh, being supportive. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, um, in the interest of time, let me be brief but not without recognizing the presence of the Attorney General and Justice Timar in particular for this important topic. I think this is um, a great opportunity on a rather critical issue, and I really appreciate that you take out the time for that. And to thank the Dean, Mr. Mwenzi, for the welcome. My name is Ulf Linden. I'm the Director of the Regional Office of the Heinrich Foundation, which is one of the four German political foundations present in Kenya and in the region. And we are the, the one that's associated with the Green Party uh, in Germany, associated, not, not part of, we are, we are linked ideologically and thematically. So we work on issues of gender democracy, environmental issues, food rights, and regional and international dialogue, including civil society and human rights um, in the region. And as such, um, I wanted to First of all, congratulate you for picking this particular topic uh, for this debate. Many before me have said how, how timely it is, how relevant it is also. And I just want to abuse the opportunity to um, highlight that this is for us a support that we're giving in the context of a wider engagement in which we've also partnered with many of those present here, including IMLU, uh, the Matharis of Social Justice Center, Amnesty International, the International Justice Mission, uh, KNCHR and African Uncensored on a project called The Missing Voices. Um, it is not yet public, it is not yet out, but it is going to come out in the coming months. Um, and it will be showcasing the victims of extrajudicial killings, the circumstances of their lives, the circumstances of their deaths, and the judicial follow-up that their deaths have, have seen. And um, in other words, it will be telling the story that these missing voices did not live to tell. Um, we do not approach this as an easy subject at all, and for sure your discussions will, will reconfirm that over the coming day, two days, to, um, that it is a complex issue, and um, one that, that, that requires broad engagement and, and no simple finger pointing, simple allocations of blame, but a, a very deep discussion, I think, of the, of the legal context, as well as the institutional responsibilities attached to it. So in that spirit, I wish you the best of discussions, and uh, hope that you will also generate some insights that will further help to address this issue in the interest of both human rights and, and the Constitution. Thank you very much. And uh, you can tap us as well, the old Kenyan books, and let's keep this conversation going. Thank you. Um, just before, as well, before I invite the DBC, I'd like to recognize the members of staff, Parkland, Ampas, okay, who are here, and I'd like to send a standard mention to my Dr. David Kabata. Thank you, Madam Kabata. Madam Kabata. Professor Tomas Gillen. Mr. Kenneth Kukudin. Uh, I hope I have a good idea in the director. Uh, I have not finished my units in the public. So, that's why I said that I have to use the representative of the Vice Chancellor Professor Sainana, who is Fatima Cheke, sorry. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is um, the humble duty of uh, reading the remarks from our Vice Chancellor, and it's an honor for me to have been asked to do that. And uh, before I do so, with your permission, we 
Honorable Attorney General in the Justice Kimaru is to take note that this root court competition how it is full impact. It is full impact and this is what the Vice Chancellor is not able to see wherever he is, he's away abroad. And I will take this message because it tells us how well organized uh, the competition has been and it tells us something about the sponsors and the organizers. Thank you very much. And the second thing also is to note that the fact that Law School of Kenyatta University, the school is intact. Dean, thank you very much. We know what is going on in the country and this is a message that I really need to take back to the Vice Chancellor, that the school is going on, its activities are going on and interrupted as uh, people pursue their rights, they are also allowing the others to pursue what they have chosen to do. So thank you very much. Now, the Honorable Attorney Professor Gil Mugai, Chief Guest, the Honorable Justice Luca Kimaru, Judge of the High Court, the representative of the Attorney General, Dr. Marisela Uma, Executive Director, Henry Ford Foundation, Kenya, Executive Director, Kenya Law, Executive Director, International Justice Mission, Kenya, the Executive Director, Independent Medical Legal Unit, Kenya, Executive Director, Amnesty International, Kenya, Executive Director, Kenya Human Rights Commission, Representative, the Independent Policing Oversight Authority, Representative Transparency International, members of faculty of schools of law, universities of Nairobi, Moore, Strathmore, Riara, Jomo Kenyatta, Kabarak, Nazarene, PC, and the Catholic University of East Africa, members of faculty, Kenyatta University School of Law, students from various law schools, including all competitors, distinguished guests, and the famous, famous Kenyan friends, all protocols of that, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning from the Vice Chancellor. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you today's morning to Kenyatta University and to the sixth edition of all Kenyan Moot Court Competition, AKMCC. Kenyatta University is once again proud to host the sixth edition of the AKMCC. It is a signature moot competition involving all Kenya school, law schools that is organized and hosted by the Kenyatta University School of Law students. The moot competition offers all Kenya school law students an opportunity to engage in academic discourse on a contemporary legal issue. Through the moot competition, Kenyatta University aims to stimulate learning and also initiate national discourse with a view to providing solutions to contemporary social issues. This is in line with the philosophy of Kenyatta University, which is sensitivity and responsiveness to social needs and the right to every person to knowledge. This year, the theme of the moot competition is striking the balance between respect for human rights and maintaining national security. Undoubtedly, the theme resonates with Kenya's current issues. The issue of guaranteeing national security while ensuring respect for human rights remains an ongoing concern in Kenya. Questions of how to counter terrorism while maintaining respect for human rights and how police ought to deal with criminal gangs features in the day-to-day -day discussions in this country. By adopting this sixth edition's theme, Kenyatta University creates a platform to stimulate national discourse among law students, the judiciary, the national security agencies, legal practitioners, human rights institutions, both government and non-governmental, the academia and other agencies dealing with human rights, policing, and national security. The AKMCC is thus a symbol and a metaphor through which as law schools and as institutions of higher learning we can make a contribution in resolving contemporary societal challenges. Over the next two days, 11 law schools from across the country will be competing for the top prize. 
I must congratulate all the participating, participating teams for having come this year. Your participation in this moot competition is a stepping stone to your legal career. It is our hope that your participation and engagement in the next two days with judges, magistrates, esteemed legal scholars, human rights practitioners, and renowned legal practitioners will transit legal knowledge and help instill fundamental ideas and values, not only in the practice of law, but in responsiveness to humanity in successive generations of lawyers. Finally, I would like to appreciate the sponsors of the APMCC, the National University of Henry Ford Foundation, Independent Medical Legal Union, International Justice Mission, Kenya Law, Kaplan and Stratton, and the Kenyatta University Students Association for supporting the School of Law in organizing and hosting this event. We say Asante Sana to all teams. Thank you for accepting our invitation. And I wish you all the best of experience in this competition and may the best competitor win. Thank you very much from Professor Paul Wainaina, Vice Chancellor in the University. We are very honored and happy that you've been partnering with us. Let's all rise and see how it's going. I'm surprised that I was invited to talk before my teacher, Professor Gilbert Mungai. Uh, but I recognize him. My teacher, Professor Gilbert Mungai, the Attorney General of the Republic of Kenya. DVC, Madam Matuma, the Dean, Mr. Suzuki Muizi, my learned friend, Maricela Oma, our sponsors, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Yes. Uh, so, I make my speech. Uh, Nelson Mandela, the, president, the founding president of the Republic of South Africa, said to deny people their human rights is to challenge their very humanity. John F. Kennedy, the president of the United States of America, said the rights of every man are diminished when the rights of one man are threatened. They are both two courts by the globally renowned world leaders bring to the fore the competing moral and legal dilemma for states in their quest for balance, respect for human rights, vis a vis ensuring that a state's national security is guaranteed. The dilemma therein has been how to determine what ought to take presidents over the other. This need not be the case as the two concepts are intertwined. Human rights have been held to be rights that are to an individual by virtue of their existence irrespective of race, sex, nationality, religion, or any other status. As such, they are God given, inalienable, and not granted to an individual by another individual, the state, non state actor, or whatever the case may be. The global community under the ambit of the United Nations in recognition of the importance of protection of human rights as a tool for promotion of global peace drafted and adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, which has since been ratified and domesticated by most of the members, member states by enactment of Bill of Rights, forming part of their constitutions. Some of these human rights include the right to life, the right to liberty, Right to fair trial, to name but a few. Human rights are at two levels, in that there are those which are absolute, inalienable, while there are those that are not absolute. National security as a concept has been defined by many international 
relations and security scholars. I however choose to go with the relations by one of the leading scholars on international security, Barry Buzan, who is a professor of international relations at London School of Economics, who in his works, New Patterns for Global Security in the 21st Century, opined as follows, and I quote, Security is about pursuit of freedom from threats and ability of states to maintain their independent, independence, identity, and integrity against forces of change, threats which they be hostile to the very existence of the state. End of quote. Nation, state, the nation of the state must here be construed to be the people within the state as well as the, the territory within which the people in the state reside. The concept of national security, therefore, is about state survival as such, where threats towards the state are detected, the same warrants some form of emergency action by way of taking exceptional measures, which may include use of excessive force or denial of fundamental rights to ward off the perceived threat. The understanding, therefore, is that the perceived threat possible Possess the ability, possesses the ability to limit the enjoyment of rights by exception of the state and the suppression of the threat, therefore, is meant to ensure that the same does not occur. Therein lies the national security problem. Globally, in the aftermath of the September 11 attack 2011 in, the, in America, in the American homeland, and the down of the 21st century glo globalized terror forests across the world. Governments across the world, under a raft of measures aimed at making their country, undertook a raft of measures aimed at making their country safe. This took the form of legislations, amendments to existing legislation, and executive decrees. One of the biggest casualties of this war on terror was human rights, which were thought to hinder the attainment of national security objectives of the state. The narrative was that human rights such as the right to fair trial, the right to picket, the right to assembly, the right to privacy, and the right not to be submitted to arbitrary arrest, would stand in the way of national security of a nation, and as such, the rights should take a back backbench role in the states. In Kenya, the Bill of Rights contained in Chapter 4 of the Kenyan Constitution 2010 is, anchor, is the anchoring framework for social, economic, and cultural policies. It is binding on all state organs. However, the rights and freedoms guaranteed under the Bill of Rights are absolute only in few specified instances. But in few specified instances, but even the rights which are limited are protected from abuse by a careful network of provisions. At the of the Constitution has set up rights and freedoms which are absolute. Freedom from torture and cruel, inhuman and detained treatment or punishment and rights to an order of habeas corpus is one of the absolute rights. All other rights are provided for in the Bill of Rights can be limited as long as they comply with the requirements of Article 24 of the Constitution, which is the limitation clause. In the wake of increased terror attacks and political unrest, there has been allegation that the state has been under the guide has under the guise of national security funds concerns the infringing of the rights of the citizens. Most of the complaints have been from state agencies, compliance with the provisions of Article 49, 31, 32, 33, and Article 50 of the Kenya Constitution 2010, which deals with the rights of suspected suspects and accused persons as well as privacy rights. There has been you and cry from many of the human rights and governmental organizations on the issue of lengthy pre charge detention of suspected terror suspects and the subsequent denial of bond upon being presented to court. They argue that the security crisis has been led to, the security crisis has led to exaggerated claims of danger by government and unnecessary deprivation of civil liberties under the guise of national security threat. And these are the questions which I wish to pose. Are national security and human rights in conflict? Is it a case of compatible twins between security and human rights, which should win? Can there be a balance between national security and human rights? These are some of the cardinal questions that throw the mind 
of those engaging in the discourse on human rights and national security as they seek to provide a way forward that ensures the permanence of the state. To actively synthesize the debate, we sh should ask ourselves a few questions first. When we say national security, who do we necessarily have in mind? Nat national security for whom? Is it for the regime or for the people? When we say national security, what is the reference point? What are the necessary conditions for national security? When we say human rights, what do we necessarily have in mind? The synthesis is simple. Where national, when national security is for the regime, human rights become useless in the furtherance of the regime in any place across the world. Political rights, such as the rights to belong, cricket demonstrate, or assembly, as well as the right not to be subjected to arbitrary arrest, becomes a negation of the interests of the regime. But it is a national security built on a quicksand. As Brian L. Jobs argues in his book, The Insecurity Dilemma, National Security of the Third World, states, national security defined as a regime security by state authorities becomes incompatible, pitted against the incompatible demands of ethnic, social, and religious forces. Such a state falls in the trap of the insecurity dilemma as a repressive strategy for national security, a consequence of the underlying logic of regime holders, interest in their short-term survival of prospects, which cannot serve the state in the long run. The ensuring paranoia that sees human rights as being detrimental to the persons of national security can be summarized as a logical self defeating extreme obsession of a security that at best resembles a house of cards. Let me elaborate by using a case of which all of you are familiar with, the Rwandan genocide of 1994. The paranoia that characterized the then Hutu regime of even as Ibrahimana would lead to the same regime adopted some impressive strategies in human rights orchestrated by the core political elite, elite in the executive, the military, and the police in the name of national security. The result would be the Rwanda genocide. However, rather than end ethnic insurrections characterizing Rwanda between 1990 and 1994, it enhanced the downward spiral of the regime. Two refugees in neighboring Uganda under the umbrella of one patriotic front would, step, would start a campaign to take back their homeland with little opposition, except around Igadi, where the routed government forces and operation had begun in early April and ended in July of 1994. Why was the total regime of human rights defeated? Rather, invested on what it defined as security on the regime itself. To this end, therefore, we can argue that human rights are necessary for the well-being of the state as well as its national security. A national security built on suppression of rights sooner rather than later bursts in its own bubble while one based on human rights ensures its long-term survival. This has foundation in social Darwinism, with the purpose of the authority of diversity, the to the students, Incidentally, I wanted me an A. <laughs> yes. So, human beings strive to be free, and as social contract theory tell us, are only united by the state to achieve the common goal of security. However, contrary to the logical understanding of Max Weber, in his 1919 thesis on the state as likely holding the monopoly over the next to the use of force, States that primarily dwell on force as the rise on the entry of their survival do not stand the test of time. Rather, a key ingredient of the state beyond the monopolization of force is the rejuvenation of the citizenry through the provisions of social values key among the human rights. To this end, therefore, the state that upholds the rights to liberty and participation in political life, such as the right to life, equality before the law, freedom of speech, the right to fair trial, freedom of religion and voting rights, and ensure social economic quality as a key tenet of the citizen's life by according the citizen to equal conditions and treatment and provisioning a right to be employed 
in just and favorable conditions, rights to food, housing and health care, as well as social security and employment benefits, will most likely be better able to safeguard itself from external machinations. Indeed, this is the key reason, reasoning that framers of our, the framers of our constitution were thinking of in ensuring the inclusion of Article 43 on social economic rights in our constitution. The need to ensure group and collective rights, the right to self-determination, the right to economic and social development, the right to a healthy environment, the right to natural resources, the right to communicate and communication rights, the right to participation in cultural heritage, as well as the right to intergenerational equity and sustainability is also the honor to, to ensure a happy citizenry in a happy environment. Should human rights be traded away in this manner in order to safeguard the community, or should human rights be inviolable? The answer is both yes and no. In time of public emergency, which threatens the life of the nation and the existence of which is officially proclaimed, the state may take measures derogating from their human rights obligations to the extent strictly required by the exigencies of the situation, while taking measures to notify competent authorities such as Parliament, provided that such measures are not inconsistent with the Constitution and do not involve discrimination solely on the ground of race, color, sex, language, religion, and social origin. Furthermore, in the age of Ebola, SARS, avian flu, swine flu, and all manner of communicable diseases capable of transmission across the globe, a short term notice on assignment of freedom of movement may, for, for instance, be required. Can we therefore balance the two across the globe, balancing national security in the protected rights against the object of the authorities in making the law that conflict with the rights? In Canada, South Africa, and the United States, for instance, this requires that all laws be open to judicial assessment for compliance with the constitutional norms. In Australia, this can involve a court seeking to ascertain whether the law seeking to curtail a right is directed to a legitimate end which is reasonably appropriate and adopted to serve that end. In balancing, however, as the crux of the paper's argument sharply shows, it is never appropriate to derogate from certain absolute human rights such as the right to life and liberty and the freedom from torture regardless of the exigencies of national security. But there is a caveat. Rights must be addressed in view of ensuring social, economic and your political realities if there is to be a balance between the observance of human rights and national security. It is therefore paramount important that state, state set up procedures and legal framework capable of waiving the sometimes overblown claims of threats to national security. Such procedures and laws would be able to test such claims of threat, explore their relations to the exercise of civil liberties and establish the limits of such institutions. If the balancing approach will necessarily be engaged, as Ben Golder and John Williams argue in the article, balancing national security and human rights, assessing the legal response of common law to nation, common law nations to the threat of terrorism, the decision makers should require the most cogent empirical evidence available that the proposed means of achieving the goal of community safety and national security will actually be effective. This rule of balancing requires the decision maker to justify the derogation of human rights by reference to a demonstrated link between the means which derogates from the human rights and the end, community safety and national security. In the context of a, of a parliament legislating prospectively, this will require policy makers to make some attempts to forecast the social, political, economic purpose of their proposed actions. In conclusion, therefore, the two human rights and national security need to not be in competition. National security and promotion of human rights remains the government's core business. As such, insecurity remains the liberty's greatest threat and government's greatest responsibility. It is a delicate balance. It is therefore gratifying that this year's mood competition topic addresses these current and vexed topics. In the course of your deliberations and debates, it is my sincere hope that you will be able to learn and appreciate the ramifications of the two topics that you have chosen to interrogate. At the end of it all, it is my sincere hope that you will not only gain knowledge 
but also enjoy yourselves in your presentations, talk and against the emotions. Most importantly, you should take the opportunity in the two days of the emotions to make friends and establish your business. It is now my simple pleasure to declare the most competition 28 of percent and supporters, I'll be very brief. Um, I thought I would have made my comments before Judge Kimar spoke. It's okay. Uh, okay. So that uh, uh, he would not have shown his hand. Yes. That is to say, I wouldn't have the benefit of uh, knowing what he was going to say. But I think everything happened for a purpose. Uh, I want to start by saying that uh, although my very, very able assistant, Dr. Maricela, had agreed to come and make remarks on my behalf, when my appointment for this morning fell through, I decided to come myself uh, to say goodbye to you, uh, uh, the scholarly community of the law. As you must have read in the media, after seven, almost seven years in the state law office, I have moved on to pursue other interests. And uh, since I have been uh, associated with this school since it was founded, I actually opened this building and I have been associated with the mood. I thought I should come and say goodbye. Not to mention, my Judge Kimaru has intimated that one way of always feeling young is by staying with the young. And there is no better place uh, than in the university. Not only because people are young physically, but because they are young in the ideas that they possess. <clears throat> I think the Moot Court continues to be a very important forum for our students to test their knowledge of the law, their ability to present it, their ability to convince. And as I used to say when I was a teacher, uh, I used to say to my students in your students, there is no right or wrong answer. There is only a well-argued case. So don't spend your time worrying whether you wrote for me the right reply. There is no right reply. Just let me hear the arguments that support whatever position you've taken. And if they are sound, then you are on the law, on the way to become a good law. Uh, the MC, Mr. MC, has made some very, very complimentary uh, comments. I think that is because uh, he obviously is a man who looks into the future the more allies you can make in life, <laughs> but the less enemies you make, the further you can go. Uh, but it is true that uh, I have had the singular privilege uh, of uh, being involved in, with the law for three decades plus. I have argued cases uh, in international tribunals and forums at the ICC, at the ICJ, and many other places. And I know this to be true. You are receiving in this country a very sound legal education. I have never appeared in any international forum where I felt, oh my God, I need to find a properly educated lawyer to tell me what is going on here. In fact, 
some modesty if I may say. <laughs> On many occasions I have felt that we were not communicating with the, my interlocutors <laughs> because their understanding of the law to my own mind is threadbare. <laughs> <laughs> so you are in you are receiving a good education, Mr. Dean. You should be proud. And uh, uh, and this moot court is evidence of that. I have listened to students arguing, and I think you have the capacity of any good student anywhere in the world. As regards the topic of today's business, let me just say one thing. I think, like Judge Chimaru has said, that this and I think one of the representatives say, this is such a relevant issue today uh, that uh, yeah, the, the organizers must be commended for choosing this topic. The challenge of maintaining a stable, viable, constitutional democracy on the one hand, and respecting the rule of law and human rights on the other, is a daily struggle. And uh, in the seven years that I was in the state law office, uh, not wearing a professorial hat, I spent a lot of time in court telling the judges, uh, like they say in Cabrillo country, moss moss. <laughs> Move slowly. Move slowly. Uh, because uh, we are, uh, my view was, you know, we have a <coughs> We have a fragile constitutional democracy in a very dangerous uh, part of the world. We are surrounded by porous borders where thousands upon thousands of people are refugees. Some of them are armed, some of them are radicalized, some of them are dangerous. And we are dealing with very good, solid uh, lawyers who have the other argument. The government has a, is making excuses. Instead of developing robust institutional capacity, government is using crude force. And then we would argue and argue, and you know, the judges would decide sometimes large lane or whatever. So, I'll, I'll, I'll just say that. <laughs> Such a, sometimes large lane in the middle, sometimes a little bit way in the Let me give you a very concrete case that I want you to, in my view, it typifies for us in Kenya this dilemma in very clear terms. Five, six or so years ago, the government <coughs> arrested two nationals of a Middle East country who had come through our airport and who had been tracked by the people whose business it is to do that. Those two nationals had enough explosive material to blow up the whole of international Kenyatta International Conference Center plus one, plus something to spare. They were arrested in their hotel room, their, yeah. their computers were confiscated, their phones were taken away from them. Using that material, security forces went to where this was this TNT was buried in Mombasa. It was recovered, a prosecution was mounted. Last week, they were convicted. Last week, two weeks ago, the, high, uh, the Court of Appeal, the Court of Appeal overturned the conviction. On what basis? On the basis that there was a lack of those of you who are evidence lawyers, that the chain of possession of some item or other had not been proper, properly established. I don't know what is 
the right thing or the wrong thing. I want you to think about such a case. I have no doubt that the court has affirmed the importance of procedural law, the importance of the human rights of the, of the suspect, and so on. I'm not sure myself what the court has said about the security of the threatened state itself. I don't know whether the court is wrong or whether it is right. I'm one of those Jews who believes that uh, once a court has spoken, uh, it must be right. Uh, what, and uh, if you are unhappy with the result, you go to the Supreme Court. I am told the Supreme Court has taken up the matter. I just want. So when you finish the Wood Court, come down to the Supreme Court and listen to that case. And then you will see that what you are involved in today is a life, very life, very contemporary issue. Before I sit down, I want to thank um, most of the organizations here represented for the support they gave me in my time in office. We did some wonderful work on some very groundbreaking human rights defending legislation. We, we passed an anti-torture law after nine years of trial. We passed a coroner's law to call upon security agencies to account for unlawful death. passed a Victims' Compensation Act and set up a Victims' Compensation Fund. And last but not least, we set up a Legal Aid Scheme. For me, the Legal Aid Scheme is the signature legacy issue. I became a Legal Aid worker in first year. Now don't ask me how long ago that was the mean one. Miss Young knows. But I'll leave it at that. Legal aid is so important. Otherwise, everything we do with the law will not mean much to the majority of the people because they will have no access to the law. So I want to thank you so much for inviting me and to wish you very well in your competition uh, may, may the best lawyer win. Thank you.
uh, I am the president of All Kenyan Mukuru Competition 2018. And uh, I've been in this committee for the last four years. I joined the committee when I was in the first year. And I joined as a member, became uh, the communications director when I was in the second year, became the assistant coordinator when I was in the third year. And now I am the president of the All Kenyan Mukuru Competition in my final year of All Kenyan Mukuru Competition. And uh, the All Kenyan Mukuru Competition is a competition that was started six years ago by the third, third class that ever began in Kenyatta University School. Ideally, what we do is bring together students from all law faculty in our country to be able to assist us in engaging in a discourse of what exactly a pertinent issue or a contemporary issue in the legal fraternity happening at that time. So ideally it's just a conglomerate of where all law students in the country meet and engage in that issue. My name is Nelly Jalimonchi a uh, law student at Kenyatta University School of Law, fourth year finalist as a lady. I, I feel honored to participate in such a, an amazing event and being one of the organizers, I've, uh, it has helped me inspire other women who feel like human rights activism is a, a big challenge and only men can do it. And um, as we've seen over the years, human rights activists like um, the fem feminism movement and even how the CEDO convention came about, it is through the activism of women and women who come together to work together. My name is Mike Bruno I am a fourth year law student in Kenyatta University. And in all Kenyan World Cup competition, I am in charge of the memorials. Now, basically, the main challenge that we face is all Kenyan World Cup competition as a committee is how to raise the funds that uh, enable this program to go on. Annually, we have to seek funds from sponsors. And this year we managed to get uh, sponsors from very well able um, NGOs such as INLU, NBH, Kenya Human Rights Commission, Kenya Law, who have always supported us ever since we started the AKMCC six years ago. Well, um, that depends. For example, in Kenya we have our constitution under Article 25, um, which provides for rights that cannot be limited. Uh, such rights are rights to fair trial, um, habeas corpus. As it has been seen, the government always oppresses the human rights, the, its citizens, and the government should be the one that should implement these human rights. But as you've seen of late, the courts have given orders that these judgments be implemented, but the executive should implement these judgments. But unfortunately, it's not doing the same. So, in my opinion, I think the government has not done its job well. There's a lot that needs to be done. That's why we have international organizations, uh, national NGOs that have come uh, together this time so that we can advise, we can, we can see a way forward of ensuring that everybody knows their rights. Now, human rights there mean there is a right to fair trial, which is provided uh, by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, and also our own constitution under Article 50. Um, when you are arrested, uh, you should be taken into custody, but you should be told why you're being arrested. And from arrest, when you're taken to the custody, you have a right to be released on bail. You also have a right to be released on, on bond. Um, but as much as we have this right, uh, you know, someone's right ends where the other person most begins. So you cannot just be exercising your rights without considering that the other person has rights. Uh, with that regard, yeah, as we enjoy our rights, we have to be careful so that we do not step on other people's toes because we are all human beings and uh, we are entitled to equality, we should be treated in fairness. So it's not only the government, it's also you as an individual, you should observe these human rights.
um, being a member of the old Kenyan Newsport competition for the past three years, um, we as the old Kenyan Newsport competition struggle to find uh, the, the current the current happenings, what's happening in the society. Uh, for instance, this time uh, post election experienced a lot of killings and forced disappearance. The government is refusing to uh, uh, follow the court orders. So this time we thought that this theme on human rights was the best suited this time. When the students sit down and interact on this issue, I can give you an example. About two years ago, uh, the United Nations Human Rights Commission, uh, the United Nations Commission for Human Rights and Refugees, uh, we conducted a moot court and the basis was on refugee law. Four months down the line, whatever we had discussed in the competition ended up being something that happened in our country when the deputy president gave the directive to close the DAP camp. And we had already discussed this issue in the MOOC competition. So you find that we usually preempt something that's already there. So you find that even the cases that are ongoing right now, the Willy Kimani case, the weekend of case, whatever judgments will be given by our judges here, most likely won't fall short of what people will have discussed here. So we usually shape a national dialogue on matters of human rights. And, uh, and I think this competition is not even serviced enough as to what it actually brings to the But human rights can only be implemented by you yourself. It doesn't start from the government or the institution or anyone. Human rights begins with you. You protect your right, I protect my right, and we correct the government whenever the rights have been, have been gone against. My experience has been nice because it's a bad year for me. So it has helped me in growth in terms of advocacy and expression in terms of different areas and different topics that I deal with. So the competition is bringing solutions to emerging issues which are affecting us. So for example, we try to bring solutions in human rights, which is a current issue, which we work in hand with the judiciary and the society to balance the goal. It's a very hectic job. It's not easy being the president, but it's still easy because I've had the best team I could ever work with. Uh, the people that came into this committee have shown resilience. Uh, this success cannot be attributed to me alone. It can only be attributed to the entire committee, minus me, because without them, then we would not have done this. So I, I'd like to thank all of them. And the committee, I'd say, uh, this year's committee has gone an extra mile to do what other committees don't. We've had this relation as a committee that uh, I've loved because it's not only business, but we we are able to be happy together and we, we have fun together. And when it, time, when it comes time to business, uh, it's business. So I'm very privileged to be the president of the team that is probably going to go down in history as uh, the best all Kenyan musical competition team that has ever stepped foot in uh, Kenya University School. Okay. So we, as AKMCC, we would like to invite all participants and all sponsors to the all um, all Kenyan human rights competition and let's talk human rights the rights and also how to get the information and who should get the information but human rights can only be implemented by you yourself it doesn't start from the government or the institution or anyone human rights begins with you for the winners uh, it's quite a big thing for them Definitely, they'll be able to get uh, the prizes that we are in the very good prizes. They're also going to get uh, IC material from uh, our various sponsors, which can help them in research. Apart from that, we usually negotiate with our partners to be able to give them things that are, to be able to give them a uh, internship opportunity. And this helps them because as, as they grow and nurture their, their, their talent as lawyers, they need these internship opportunities. And it opens so many doors. For them so for the participants and the, the winners who are going to win this competition just know this is the best decision you ever made and uh, after this it's just doors that are going to open for you after the competition i'd like to thank mostly our partners um, beginning with the uh, henry Paul foundation who have given so much the time and everything to be able to ensure that this competition is successful also international justice mission who i cannot be able to thank enough uh, they've sent in their team they were in with our communications people they were in for uh, most of our most of our uh, planning meetings actually personally i'd like to thank diana and our maida and kironji 
and uh, Karis, who have really assisted us from IJM. No false Mr. Craig uh, Darren, who have also assisted us so much. Uh, Kenya Law definitely for people for being a uh, partner for the long haul and uh, the promise that they made that they continue supporting us. We also have IMLU, the Independent Medical Legal Unit, who have come in on board this time round. We want to thank and we hope that uh, we'll continue with this immediately after. We would also like to thank um, Kaplan and Stratton who have also assisted us and uh, Kenya Human Rights Commission, uh, Mr. Martin Mabugina. We would like to thank you very, 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 very much for the assistance you've given us. And of course, we cannot forget Kenya University, which is a school that hosts this competition. And also, my committee definitely would also like to thank you and the participants themselves because I say this competition we might maybe have raised the largest amount of money or we might have uh, brought the best kind of judges, the best people to be able to open our ceremony. But if it were not for the participants, then we, this competition would not be there. So these are the key stakeholders and we'd like to thank each of them, whoever has come to participate. Thank you very, very much because uh, we've made this competition, this competition is yours. And uh, we cannot say many thanks to you, but uh, I think that's, that's sufficient. I'd like you to welcome you to All Kenya Mood Competition 2018, 6th edition. Thank you. Welcome guys to the 6th edition of All Kenya Mood Competition, where we say let's go. Let's go.